Hey guys, thanks for tuning us in for the fifth episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you would, please take time to drop a like, comment, or feedback. Special guests on this fifth episode include South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, David and Lorenzo Henry, Michael Costa, correspondent on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, educator Heather Smith, and country music and Christian artist Zach Williams. Our first guest is South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who spoke on Monday evening at the Republican National Convention. Senator Scott has written a book, Opportunity Knocks, the story of how hope and opportunity can change everything, which released in April. Had the chance to visit with him when the book released, and with him being involved with the National Convention this week, thought this was a great opportunity to share this great visit. Senator, thanks so much for your time. Cameron, it's good to be with you, and I'm glad to hear that you... Uh... You know my good friend James Lankford, one of the best voices, the most sincere people in all of politics. Right now, COVID-19, coronavirus, we've obviously talked with James quite a bit. But uh, tell us your your outlook on this, the, the, the positives, the, 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 the negatives, and uh, you got a book kind of wraps all of this together as well. Yes, sir, I, I do, Cameron. So the positives from my perspective, let me start with the negative instead. The negative, okay. we've had you know, several hundred cases. 20-plus thousand deaths. We are battling back. The president's containment strategy was really smart at the beginning. The mitigation strategy has been flattening the curve. So those are the ugly realities of this uh, COVID-19. The positives being the mitigation and the containment. Right now, as we have flattened the curve, we also have flattened the economy. So the president is looking for a way to balance both, which is really important. I think we're going to get it done without any question. We are all in it to win it. And the good news is the president's leadership and folks like uh, Senator James Lankford and others are playing a significant role. The CARES Act was successful and impactful. We need to do more of that uh, as it relates to the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. We need to continue to fund that, and we need to negotiate on the rest of it. We can't write checks that we don't know how to cash. So uh, my book, The Opportunity Knocks, really speaks about how to overcome adversity. Where do you find certainty in uncertain times? And Opportunity Knocks really tells the story of my life and how even in politics, my relationship with President Trump started in the midst of an obstacle that became the greatest opportunity. And that's why Opportunity Zones is a part of our success in this nation today, Opportunity Zones, bringing help to the most impoverished people in the country because President Trump was supportive of that plan. And it also chronicles overcoming adversities in education, uh, health, losing a job as I have, losing a political race as I have. The good Lord has turned my failures into... Uh, lessons that I'm, being, I'm trying to share with other people. Opportunity Knocks, available wherever books are sold. And uh, speaking of that, uh, getting through the, the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, I think, Senator, a lot for everybody is is the mental, uh, the, the, the mental a- aspects of what this has been doing to us. Cameron, it is devastating when you think about the mental aspect of it. One of the reasons why James and I both fought to make sure that nonprofits and faith, the faith community was included as a part of the response in the CARES Act is because we know that the psychological scar tissue, the emotional hole, is going to have to be filled with good, competent wisdom. And we wanted to make sure that we resourced those nonprofits in the faith community so as to be prepared for the challenges that are coming because of the social distancing and the challenges of losing lives and family members being sick and not being able to get to them because the protocols in place prevents families and loved ones from being together at the most critical time. So I do think that there's no doubt we have to have our front line uh, completely resourced, whether that's the healthcare workers or the faith and nonprofit community to so they can struggle together with those who have been just devastated by the coronavirus. 
And of course, everybody looks forward to the the end game. And and what do you think it's going to look like whenever things are actually open and restored? And the uh, you know you know the American people are resilient, and it seems like whenever the chips are down, uh, man, we really come together. And and I look forward to a great reunion time. Absolutely, Cameron. We're heading in that direction now. In my opinion, the president spoke yesterday with a group of senators that he has appointed. I think including James Langford. And what he has done is, is staging basically the return to normal. As he says, it's not going to be a new normal. He's hoping for the same normal that we had before. Small group gatherings uh, following the social distancing is phase one. Being able to expand it with stricter protocols for a larger group, phase two. And then phase three, as we start seeing businesses re- returning their workers to their businesses. We have to isolate hot spots to mitigate the spread, and both will require abundance of testing. He spoke, the president spoke yesterday about needing to flood the market with tests. I think he's spot on, and that's how we get the economy roaring again. The first step, the prerequisite, is we have to have testing on demand, and that's exactly where we're heading. And again, the new book, Opportunity Knocks. Uh, Senator and Tim Scott, it has been great to, to visit with you this morning. Looking forward to spending some more time with the book and uh, hope you uh, have, have a blessed weekend, my friend. Thank you, Cameron. You do the thing. God bless. Again, you can find out all his social media and more information about his books at scott.senate.gov. Next up, I had the opportunity to visit with Heather Smith, author of the new book, Mastering the New Education, whatever that may be, which is available now. Heather has been a middle school and high school teacher for more than two decades and talks about what she's learned in that span and how it has helped her be prepared for whatever the new normal just might be. She is a veteran middle school and high school social studies teacher, mother of two elementary school children, got a, a new book. And this this book, first off, uh, Heather, thanks for taking the time. Heather Smith on with us this morning. I got, I got too deep into it, Heather. First off, thanks so much for taking the time. No, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And it's great to be able to connect with your audience, parents, teachers, um, even students. So thank you. And in the, the the book we're talking about mastering the new education, whatever that might be, and and, and for you, this was uh, originally kind of uh, just what, what was this more of like a, a journal for you of of what you were having to go through as COVID nineteen closed schools down. So um, we as teachers actually don't have time to write books. It's it's not the norm for us because we're so busy trying to prepare for our classes. So this actually started out as me reflecting on our remote education that we were thrown into and trying to figure out how I was going to handle the upcoming school year without actually knowing what the plan for the upcoming school year was. Um, Most of our districts have actually just come out with what their plan was, and they continue to change. Um, Actually, on every single website of the schools, it says, oh, and by the way, this is subject to change uh, based on circumstances. So where I'm after three months of remote, I was incredibly exhausted, as most teachers were, I would imagine. But instead of taking the time off, um, mostly because I had nowhere to vacation, but instead of taking the time off, I decided that I needed to kind of reflect on what was happening and figure out what were the the positives, what were the negatives, capitalize on the successes, and then um, kind of adjust so I don't have to go through those failures again. So in my self-reflection, I started writing. And I teach teach four different grades last year, um, 7, 8, 10, and 11, which is a pretty big range, um, all different curriculums. And I realized as I was making the plan that it was actually four different plans. Because the maturity of the students was completely different, their needs were different, the way I reacted and, and interacted with them was different. Um, so as my my reflection got longer and longer and longer, I realized there were commonalities um, that I was going to focus in on, like procedures, which took into account safety, uh, well-being of the students, but that I was actually creating four different plans which means that every 
teacher out there has to create their own plan. So while I can kind of give my plan, which I did, I gave my full plan, this is an intimate look into my classroom, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's not going to work for every teacher. It's actually probably not going to work for any other teacher than me. What, what the value of this book, Mastering the New Education, whatever that may be, is, is in the process of reflection and formulating the plan going forward. And that's why um, I decided to incorporate a virtual teaching checklist at the end of it. So, well, yes, it, it's great. You have lessons for every one of the grades that I taught, just to kind of sample what I'm, what I'm doing. But the virtual teaching checklist is direct things that teachers need to talk, need to, to focus in on when they're setting up a classroom that could be in person, that might have to go remote, that might be in between. I'm starting five days in person, but um, I'm going to have students remoting in. And what's going to happen if I'm quarantined and I have to remote in? So my procedures have to be easily transferable across any different scenario. And over the course of of your career, what, do you think that uh, some of the other things uh, that some of the other procedures that we've learned as as uh, techniques have changed? Do, do you think that helped better better prepare you for what we're going through now, as opposed to being a, a new teacher going through it? So that was my great epiphany. As as I thought I was reinventing the wheel, I, I wasn't. I, not even close. I mean, while a lot of the technology was not where we as educators needed them to be, and that's why they keep pushing out all these updates, but the actual educational techniques, the actual, the actual pedagogy, we've been training for this for the last two decades. Every single fad that's come through education is all about active classrooms, student-centered classrooms, social, emotional well-being, focusing on objectives, focusing on skills. This is nothing new. The only thing that's new is that we're bringing it all together and we really are focusing on the student. And, you know, you can't, you can't pretend if you are lecturing in front of a classroom that you're focusing on the student. You are not. And that's not what education is, and it hasn't been for a very long time. So education is going to innovate, and it's probably for the best. And again, the, the new book, Mastering the New Education, whatever that might be. And Heather, I want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can find out more information about the book and, and everything else you've got going on as well. Absolutely. So it's available on Amazon, both print and digital download, Mastering the New Education, whatever that may be, by Heather Smith. And um, it's also available in the Kindle Unlimited library. All right. Well, Heather, it's been great to visit with you. I appreciate your time and uh, and the consideration for other teachers with the book. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of your week. Oh, absolutely. And it's going to be a great school year. Thank you so much. You might remember our next guest from Wizards of Waverly Place, among many other places. David and Lorenzo Henry are going to tell us about the new movie, This is the Year, which will be having a special virtual premiere this Friday got a brand new movie that is doing a virtual release coming up on Friday. Excited to talk about that with uh, David and Lorenzo Henry on the line with us. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Hey, thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Good to good to be on. Now, now, David, first off, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you uh, take the reins here as uh, you worked along with uh, Selena Gomez uh, putting this one out. And this is your directorial debut, and uh, what do you think about the uh, the, the the final product, uh, first time around, if you will? A- a- absolutely, yeah, yeah. So Selena has been a good friend of mine since we started Wizards of Waverly Place together. I played her older brother on that show for many years, and we stayed very good friends. And if we were ever going to team up again, it had to be for something that could give fans that same magical feeling that the TV show did. And this project is exactly that. It's a, a feel-good coming-of-age teen film that can be co-viewing. In other words, you can watch it with the whole family. It's, uh, it's clean, fun. Um, and I'm super happy with the product. I was always a fan of classic 80s coming-of-age films, the John Hughes era of movies. And I wanted to update that genre and put new wine into an old wine skin, if you will. Um, and that's exactly what we did. We made a, we made a clean, coming-of-age, feel-good film that the whole family could sit down and watch that comes out on Friday uh, and you get your tickets at thisistheyear.film. 
and have one big live event with me in Salina, which is really exciting. We're, we're going to recreate the premiere atmosphere that fans can come in and watch it live with me and Selena and the whole cast. And and Lorenzo as uh, playing in in your d- brother's directorial debut. I mean, did you did you put any extra pressure on him? Did you, or did or did you kind of make it easy on him this time around? <laughs> um, I, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, time is always the enemy against independent filmmaking, um, and I think because uh, we, you know David was the director and I was one of the the leads in the film, we both knew we had to get things done fast and efficiently, but also with uh, as much talent as we can. So I think the combo worked out really well, and we plan on doing more of these in the future. And uh, putting the spin on those uh, those those classic 80s movies, uh, for, for you, David, I mean, how much of a, of a nostalgic feel did you have uh, making this one in kind of in homage to that? Yeah, it, there, there's definitely a lot of um, homage to the the 80s films, and I definitely capture a nostalgic vibe with it, because I really wanted this to be something parents could sit down and watch with their kids as well. Um, but uh, it, it it was a blast getting to recreate Wizards Nostalgia as well by having Greg Sulkin in it, who played Mason in Wizards of Waverly Place, and Uncle Kelbo, who's played by Jeff Garland. I got to have some of my friends and trusted actors that I knew could deliver and do a great job in the film and not only that, put together this live premiere where fans will get to see all of us together with Selena Gomez yet again in Q&As and fun. Um, I recommend people bring a Kleenex because you might have tears of nostalgia. <laughs> and uh, again, <laughs> you, you talk about the event, and, and, and I think this is, uh, you, you know, you've seen premieres, you've seen these, uh, the, these distant events, if you will, but this one, you've got uh, all the personalities, even, even got some live music going on as well. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we have some real visionary partners over at Bold Entertainment in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and they, you know, they said, "Let's not let this movie sit on the shelf during the quarantine. Let's it's a feel good movie. People want to feel good right now, and the thing that they can never do, even without a quarantine, is go to a premiere. Most of the world does not get to go to premieres. That's for a select group of people. Um, let's." create the premiere atmosphere. Let's make a, a, a fun, live, exciting premiere and even have a performance by the band in the film, Lovely the Band, who, who's a platinum artist. Um, let's get them involved. And, and, and so we did just that. We, we, we really, with our partners at Bold, had the vision to create this live, fun, exciting premiere. And, and Lorenzo, as, as you look toward the, uh, the opening event, I mean, obviously it's going to be different than, than any opening that we've seen in the past, but uh, how cool is it for you to maybe put that smile on somebody's face in the midst of all the, the negatives that are going on in the world today? Oh, man, it, it, it makes everything worth it. You know, um, I, you know, every actor's dream is to see themselves on the big screen and have your first movie produced go to the big screens, but... Uh, with this, this first ever live virtual premiere, we're able to bring it to everyone and everyone can experience this feel good movie. And it's so much more than uh, a movie because every ticket sale benefits COVID 19 relief. Um, we have influencers donating uh, COVID relief supplies, thousands and thousands of supplies. So we're able to turn this movie into uh, not only a feel good event, but uh, something that benefits uh, charities and uh, brings families together. So that that means more to me than anything. And again, that uh, virtual movie premiere going to be this Friday, 4.30 Pacific. That's uh, for, for those of you, we'll transpose that for you. 6.30 local time. And uh, again, David, make sure and let our listeners know where they can where they can get tickets and also keep up with more information about the, the upcoming virtual movie. A- absolutely. So it's a one-time only event. So if you don't show up on Friday... Uh, at 4.30 Pacific, 6.30 Central, 7.30 Eastern, you're not going to see it. Um, you can go to thisistheyear.film, and you can get a ticket there. It's essentially like you're buying a ticket to a, a, a live concert. Um, so you get your ticket, you'll enter that um, on Friday, the 28th, and uh, the show will begin. You'll, you'll start your live experience with, uh, with all of us. Again, uh, David and Lorenzo, looking forward to the uh, movie event this Friday. And uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Hey, I look forward to that. You have a great rest of your day. Again, you can find more information online at thisistheyear.film.
Up next is Michael Costa, a correspondent on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, which continues its coverage of campaign season tonight with their take on the Republican National Convention. Michael, first off, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Appreciate it. This is great. I got, all, I got lots of time. We're all just sitting at home here in New York, so happy to do it. Now, now, Michael, for you, obviously, the, 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 the national convention's a totally different landscape than anything we've ever seen. And so what were the biggest challenges for you preparing for last week and this week? Well, look, it has been challenging, just like it's been challenging for everyone and everyone's business. Uh, we usually are at these conventions. We are usually boots on the ground interviewing people, man-on-the-street interviews, feeling the pulse of the convention goers, that is gone. Uh, I am in an apartment in Brooklyn staring out a window at a parking lot. So um, it's a little tricky, but thankfully there's always comedy to be had, and The Daily Show is one of the only shows that when all of this hit, uh, we kept going. Trevor is in his apartment shooting the show. Uh, We did not stop. Most shows took a break. We didn't, and... So we are finding the comedy, and we're putting it out there. And, uh, you know, the Democrats push hope. Republicans push fear. I didn't think it would be any different than that, and it hasn't been. Now, have have there been any real surprises uh, for you last week or or so far this week? That's a good question. I, I was surprised at how well the conventions adjusted. I mean, they've had time. They've had time, but... These are great speeches, um, and and there's no one there. I mean, they are speaking to no one. There's a cameraman pointing. I don't, actually, I don't even know if there's a cameraman. It might even be a robot camera. Um, so I was interested in seeing their passion and seeing, look, and I'm talking about both conventions right now. I'm not saying I agree with all the speeches, but uh, these speakers are delivering energy and passion, please, and what's funny is that they give you the real wide shot, they are all alone. <laughs> and and uh, you, you talk about continuing on throughout the uh, the, the pandemic on the, on the Daily Show. And uh, how much more technical savvy are you now than you, than you were just a few months ago? Oh, my God. I mean, I am slowly, I am slowly getting there. I, I was, before this interview, I was on the phone with, uh, one of the production assistants on the show, who's, you know, 25 years old. And I'm like, why won't my microphone work? Why is the camera facing the wrong direction? And he's, like, looking at me like he's talking to his grandparents. So um, I used to always make fun of YouTubers. I used to always make fun of Instagram influencers. And now I'm literally direct messaging them, asking them, hey, what format are you shooting your audio in? Because uh, it is tricky. I have a whole more respect for editors, sound engineers, and cameramen. And what have you what have you learned about yourself during this time of having to be away and uh, and separate Ooh. from everybody? Well, I I always knew that I like alone time, but not not this much. You understand what I'm saying? So uh, I am one of those people that likes to kind of pop in a party and then pop out. And but I miss the office. I miss the energy of the studio. I miss sitting in a room with different people who have different opinions than me and trying to mine the headlines for comedy. I mean, that's one of the greatest things about The Daily Show is uh, we have such a diverse cast of people and points of view that I can say a statement and then two other people have a similar idea with a different take. We all disagree with each other. We all yell at each other. And at the end, we come up with with a comedic segment. I mean, isn't that what America should be all about? That's right. Now, now, who is who's the biggest uh, class clown, if you will? I mean, you've got uh, just a, an unbelievable array of class clowns to choose from, anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, Trevor keeps it pretty buttoned up. I think I think that's probably because when the show starts, he's got to really let the the comedy take over. So it's he's probably one of the correspondents. I mean, Ronnie Chang, who's who's now in Australia. He's been in Australia ever since the pandemic. He got crap there and can't fly home he and i like to go at each other a little bit i got nothing but love for ronnie chang but every once in a while he'll say something and i'll say ronnie that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard and then he'll say you're the dumbest thing i've ever heard and then we get in a big fight and next thing we know everyone's laughing but we're both being serious 
And you talked about the Daily Show having folks that are that are on both sides of the aisle bickering back and forth, but uh, still the love at the end of the show. And and Mike, what kind of what kind of hope does that show for us as as Americans that, that we truly can disagree, but still but still love one another, right? Yeah, yeah. You you you've got to disagree. And in fact, it's impossible not to, considering we all come from different places. I mean, I did a field piece on gun ownership in Switzerland. And it's on YouTube, and, and you know, it, it's, it's had a lot of success. But one thing that I noticed, basically the gist of it is Switzerland loves guns. They have tons of guns, and they don't have the mass shootings that we have. And I landed in Switzerland, and within five minutes I looked around, and I said, well, no wonder they all agree. They're all the same. <laughs> Everybody looks the same. They're all wearing the same sweater, the same shoes, the same jeans. Um, when you land... In America, and when you land, you know, especially in New York City, we're different. We come from different places. We have different economic, racial backgrounds. So um, this is good, everybody. This is good. We have different food. Oh, man, the food is the same crap every single night. So um, this, it, it's also harder. Look, I'm not saying it's easy. It is harder, but... Um, it's good to disagree, but then it's also good to go get a beer and not talk about it and just be friends. There you go. And again, uh, Comedy Central's coverage of the Republican National Convention continues each night uh, through the rest of the week. And Michael, always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can keep up with not only The Daily Show, but everything you've got going on as well, my friend. Thanks a lot. It's michaelcosta.com. It's also Instagram and Twitter, at Michael Costa. I, I appreciate you pushing out the show and uh it's a big country and uh but to be honest with you we're all pretty much the same and similar uh in our belief of what america is so thank you for watching the show that's right well michael great to visit with you hope you have a great rest of your week my friend talk to you later again you can tune in each night with the daily show with trevor noah on comedy central and our final guest of this episode is zach williams Zach had a breakout in the contemporary Christian music industry and has recently released a single to country radio with Dolly Parton. It's called There Was Jesus. Zach, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show. Hey, man. Thank you for having me. Now, now Zach, if uh, if our country listeners out there don't know, uh, where where did the name Zach Williams become synonymous and, and, and give you the opportunity to, to, to get a pretty good duet partner for your uh, country release, right? Yeah, uh... Well, I would say, uh, I guess about three years ago, I released my my first record uh, as a Christian artist called Chainbreaker. Um, the song had had some pretty good success, and you know, opened the door for for several other things that you know that have happened. But I, I would say the biggest thing that's that it's opened the door for would be this this new single. There was Jesus. Um, uh, we put out put out a new record in in late October of last year called Rescue Story, and. I guess I would say, um, you know, if I'm if I'm looking at the the album and you know just this collection of songs, um, you know, Rescue Story was the title track and the first single, and it just felt fitting, you know, just to call this album Rescue Story because I'm looking back at my life and 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 just seeing what you know what God's done over the last 20 years and and the places that I've been and you know the things that He's kept me away from and I can see now in all these moments that I missed, you know, there was Jesus and that that would, you know, that would be the new song with Dolly. And, and, uh, and that kind of was it, you know, uh, I wrote this song with a, uh, with a really great country writer by the name of Casey Bethard. He's written songs for all kinds of folks throughout the years. And, and, uh, we got a demo back on this song and we had a girl sing a background vocal. And I remember sitting in the, in the room listening to it. And I said, man, she kind of sounds like Dolly Parton. I said, it'd be cool if we could get, you know, the real Dolly Parton to sing on it. And, we all kind of had a big laugh, you know, like, yeah, good luck. And uh, a month, about a month later, somebody at our record label had, had gotten in touch with her management, and she agreed to listen to the song. And, and so the day that, that the day that we recorded her vocal on it, um, she she sh- showed up at the studio, and, and she said, Zach, she said, I, I didn't even I didn't know who you were. She was like, forgive me, and I was like, oh, that's fine. Most you know most people don't. She said, but uh, she said I didn't even make it through the chorus of this song, and I knew that I wanted to be a part of it. She said, this is a special song, and she said, I'm really trying to, to, get, to get back to some of the faith-based, you know, things here in my career. And she said, I want to be a part of it. And, and you know, uh, I think she could have easily came into that, that studio session that day and, 
and just, you know, mailed in a vocal and left and, and gone home. And I would have been thrilled with that, but she spent four hours, you know, working on her part that day with me in the studio. And, and she just had a way of making you feel like you were the only person in that room. And, you know, when it was all said and done and, you know, we've, we've spent some time together now and, and got, gotten to hang out on different occasions. And she just, she's one of those people that just kind of makes you feel like you're part of her family. And, and I think, you know, obviously you don't have a career as long as she's had without being that genuine of a person. And, and Zach, I, I know I mentioned this before we came on the air. I, I mentioned how reading your bio was kind of like a, a life story of myself, the ups and the downs. And yeah. how how many times do you get that uh, that response from from fans and from from folks you run into to just say, you know, maybe you uh, are a bit of an inspiration because, hey, we've been there, too. You know, it's a lot. You know, it's 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 kind of crazy how many people you meet that have a very similar, if not same story. Um, you know, I grew up in, in church. My dad was a worship leader. My mom sang at church. Um, you know, I was around it my entire life. And I feel like they planted that seed at a very early age. And so had had I not grown up with that, had I not known there was a God and there was something to come back to, I don't know, honestly, where, where I would be at now. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. I feel like, you know, just through stories that I've heard from other people that have a similar story to mine, you know, and, and through my own personal experiences, um, I'm always trying to write those songs that, that can reach somebody on a personal level, on a, on a level that they can go, you know what, I've, I've lived that. Or, you know, when I hear him sing that, I've, I can feel that he's lived that. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what I've tried to do, you know, tried to stay true to who I am and my sound, but, but just kind of change my message. You know, I, I toured in a Southern rock band for about seven years and I just lived a, a really reckless, um, lifestyle. And it wasn't until I was about 33 years old that I, came back to God and, you know, I, and I found myself, you know, at the end of my rope going, you know, I can't, I can't do this anymore on my own. You know, uh, everything I've tried to do to make this happen has turned into a failure. And it, it really wasn't until I just kind of gave it all to him and said, Hey, I need your help that, that he kind of took over and, and it has shown me the things that, you know, I've desired even more than I could have ever imagined. And, and Zach, give you an opportunity as, uh, as everybody, it's starting to reopen and, and folks are seeing some, having some faith in the opportunity to be face to face again. But what, uh, where has, uh, how much has your faith been something that you've had to rely on over the past couple months, uh, weeks, days, all that stuff as well? You know, it's, it's, I think it's really, honestly, if anything, it's allowed me to grow closer uh, in my face, because, you know, this just the uncertainty that you have whenever something like this happens. And obviously it's not something anybody, you know, most people in our, in our generation or even my pa- my parents' generation have ever really experienced anything like this. And so, you know, just that unknown of, Hey, what's going to happen with this has really allowed me to just kind of draw closer to him and just, you know, really have my faith in, you know, this is all going to work out. And through this bad situation, there's going to be a positive come out of the whole thing. That's right. And uh, Zach, again, the uh, the new single, There Was Jesus with uh, Dolly Parton. And I, and I want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can find out uh, more information on, on the other music you've got. And uh, also, whenever things open back up, where they can see you as well. Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I've got a website. It's ZachWilliamsMusic.com. It has a link to, uh, to all my socials, to all the, uh, all the digital outlets where you can find music. And it's in most of the major you know, retail stores and things if you want to buy a physical copy or you can order it online. Um, and then we have a 40 day tour happening you know, this fall. If, if, you know, if this, if all the, the bands and the restrictions are lifted, we'll be back out on the road playing music and I'll have my tour dates posted on my, on my website. All right. Well, Zach, again, great to get to visit with you for a first time. Uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. And again, thank you for your time, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. Again, thanks for joining us for this episode of Good Questions with Cameron Toll. If you ever have a comment, question, or anything else you'd like to know, find me on Instagram at aka underscore Cameron, on Twitter at Cameron Toll, on my Facebook page at Cameron Dole Altus. If you'd like to help out funding for the podcast, feel free to click on the support tab and follow the instructions. Also, feel free to share it with your friends. We look forward to seeing you soon with episode number six.